Welcome, Dr. Sudeshna Chatterjee and uh, Mr. Shivdar Das. I think this session, which is on urban mobility solutions, is going to be very, very crucial because we are at a juncture where not only the infrastructure or the urbanization is spreading across the country, but we are also looking at more and more vehicular movement, the standard of living, like we were discussing in the previous session, also increasing, and people increasing, raising their standard of living, which again leads to a lot of vehicular uh, pollution. So my first question, uh, Ms. Chatterjee is going to be with you. So here when you're talking about the larger goal of sustainability, the larger goal of India achieving the SDG goals, the Vision 2047, how do you manage the fact that yes, there is an increased vehicular movement and if that is the major cause of, of you know, the environment the deteriorating, then what's the other solution? Are we looking at India progressing to possibly become a walkable country? Can and do people have that privilege or the facility in a country like India where we still have diverse standards of living? Is it possible for a country like India? Um, thank you. Thank you, ABP, for having me here. And thanks, Aditi, for the question. You know, um, you have actually hit upon a very important issue, walkability in our cities. When we talk about livable cities or sustainable cities, at the core of it is walkability, how walkable really our cities are. And this is a very key metric. Now, in India, well, we see choked streets, streets, you know, the cars, uh, ownership going up, etc. But Despite what is very visible on the surface, car ownership in India is still very low compared to developed countries. On the other hand, what we see, there was a recent study done on urban mobility by CEW across India, which actually showed that 63% of daily trips in India are still by walking, and 6% is by cycling and another some 20% or something is actually by public transport. It's really 10% of trips are by, um, you know, uh, personal vehicles. But then how this whole car-centric planning that we have got locked into, which is a very modernist kind of a planning paradigm, um, is uh, not sustainable is not what makes livable cities. In the best cities in the world, you know, the metric of a person, we, we say that, uh, um, you know, in a lot of developed countries, prime ministers take public transport to go to work, right? It's uh, the metric of this is not whether you are going every person, the goal is not to get every person a car, but the goal is to make sure that every, the richest of the rich actually take public transport. If that is the situation in India, what we do find is that uh, there is so much investment riding on infrastructure, right? Large infrastructure, flyovers, metros, everything. In the calculus of this, where is the money for developing walking infrastructure at scale in our cities? We recently conducted uh, an evaluation of this because, you know, Mumbai is one of the Bloomberg uh, Global Road Safety Initiatives cohort cities where they really promoted 10 cities where they promoted walking. And we just finished an evaluation of 13 years of work looking at what has the city and it's the richest municipal corporation in India, right? So the, when we analyze the budget for the road transport and traffic department within BMC, we found only 2% of the budget actually goes towards improving walking infrastructure. And most of it actually goes on just creating surface treatments. The, the whole, walking infrastructure you mean, which is the, the pedestrian traffic, whatever, the, yes, the, the sidewalks, sidewalks on busy exist. streets. And, and the uh, conversation is only about surfacing. Do we put paver? Do we concretize it? What do we do? It's surface treatment. It is not about expanding the sidewalk, building the capacity, more walking capacity in the sidewalk sidewalk or making sure it's continuous. That's the other thing. We don't have continuous sidewalks in our cities. So we can say walk, people, it should be good for your health, it's good for the environment. Where will people walk? Where are the sidewalks? So, you know, it's, it's really a terrible situation we have landed ourselves in. We are building streets, we are increasing the capacity of streets because we say decongestion can only be, that's the belief, a very civil engineering perspective actually, that you can only decongest streets by building more 
adding one more lane, building more capacity. But it's not true. The whole complete street movement across the world has shown that unless we treat uh, streets as the biggest public spaces in our cities, which they are, and not just look at it in this narrow civil engineering way of channels for moving vehicles, nothing is going to change. Absolutely. And I think it's also a very a, a difficult task, not unachievable, a difficult task because in a country like India, we have a lot of our population which is still living on the sidewalks, sleeping on the sidewalks. So that also is going to be a huge challenge for India to take forward. But Mr. Das, coming to you here, we are talking about sustainability and the alternative options when it comes to movement on our roads and on our streets. But when it comes to infrastructure, what, as per you, are the most sustainable forms when it comes to infrastructural development? Anything specific that you have uh, led or you have conducted which you feel could be probably uh, a foundation stone for others to carry forward or an example for which people can probably use it for sustainable goals? So before I take this question, uh, I'll first thank ABP for this dedicated full day of conducting this uh, conclave and focused on infra. And uh, second, I'm delighted to have this audience in the room where uh, the Honorable Minister has spoken. The awards are done, lunch is done, still the change agents are there in the room. I think if they change the country, they will change the country. Because you are still focused and interested in doing something. Leo. So, coming back to, uh, the, we are here talking about last mile connections, connectivity and mobility. I always feel this last mile connectivity is a local issue, it's not a global issue. So, what does last mile connectivity mean for us? We are talking about, I get down at the airport, how do I go home? How do I drop my child to the school? How do I go to the hospital nearby? So, these are the last mile legs we are talking about. Is there an opportunity for me to walk down every day to my office? Is there an opportunity for me to use a bicycle to go one mile or a half a mile? Can I get down off my house and go and buy to a grocery store? Or do I still need a car, a driver or a four-wheeler or a two-wheeler to do that? So if those things are not there, then we don't have the last mile connectivity. And these are issues which has to be addressed by local bodies, may not be the government of India who is going to interfere or maybe NHI coming in and building those pavements and uh, footpaths on which we open vendors. And uh, see, the footpaths today in all major cities have become vending zones. So that is to be addressed at the municipality level. When you talk about innovation, when you talk about uh, something new coming in and you touched about uh, sustainability, we are doing a project, uh, this is the first uh, urban mobility solution in Varanasi, where we are bringing in ropeway. So ropeway in a very uh, large manner, which would uh, help the mobility of almost 90,000 passengers per day. And the initial capacity is 90,000 passengers per day, which will get enhanced in one of the busiest roads. So I would say the uh, challenge is more into this kind of pockets. When you see Varanasi, when you see other these religious places where there is an optimum crowd, you look at the overcrowded old markets which has never moved out of the places. So today you do whatever you want to do, but you can't move a Sadar Bazaar or a Chandni Chowk from where they are. You can't move a Kalwa Devi from where it is in Bombay. So until and unless you touch upon those localities and you touch into their uh, supply chain management, you are able to address and decongest those places, I think nothing is going to work. So these are small solutions, but very commonsensical. If people have a pathway to walk, people have a pathway to bicycle, this ropeway is something worldwide it is so popular. But we have just started doing it in India and I think there is a great opportunity to scale this. But I just want to know how much is the economic burden when we move or when we look at a transition for something what you just suggested, a ropeway, which is being done in other cities in across the country. Uh, in other countries as well, but if you want to implement it in a country like India, how economical is it or how economic heavy is it on different projects? See, this is, I think, uh, we have asked the right question to the right person coming from an economics uh, background. See, we are a large MSME dependent country. So, uh, today in every household, we can build a cottage industry. In uh, villages, if you see, there are self-help groups, those who are doing a lot of manufacturing, a lot of work. The biggest challenge for this last mile connection is for cargo and for trade, more than commuters today. Today, when you see the congested streets, have you seen how much space a tempo or a truck takes? We are talking about cars, we are talking about uh, bikes, we are talking about commuters. Commuters is not a challenge. Think or imagine a Mumbai Western Express highway without a tempo and a truck. Almost 40% of your cargo, of your traffic is gone. 
and it has a cost element. So today when any city you are calling maybe a urban company service provider to you and uh, give you a service and the electrician asks you for 20, 50 rupees, there is a 80 rupees, 90 rupees component in that which he charges for his own commuting. Yeah. Whatever you call for at home because we don't have time today to go and do the small uh, efforts and small purchases. So we call everything home, all services. So uh, today morning also, uh, while we are talking, we spoke that uh, goods, services and agriculture puts around 60% uh, of GDP. So this 60% of GDP is coming from somewhere to the main hubs, connecting to the ports, connecting to the airports, connecting to the railway stations, and that is where the major cost goes in. So it would never be unviable investing into the last mile connectivity. Uh, and, and Ms. Sudeshna, you earlier mentioned that, and, and as he was also saying that the biggest the biggest problem or challenge is to manage the commuters right now in India. And you were mentioning that there's a very small percentage of commuters who are actually using vehicles and the rest are actually walking. But how do you differentiate or, or how do you kind of try to manage the gap? Because here you're talking about people from different standards of living. Probably a person at a um, you know, a, a, a middle class level may be okay in walking, but what about the richer section? So in terms of implementation of initiatives of this nature, it can't be done immediately, but yes, the first step can be taken. So in terms of implementation, how difficult or how easy is implementation, especially again mentioning in a country like India, where you have diverse sect of people with different financial backgrounds, with different abilities and different capabilities, and of course, with different expectations of their life. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you know, uh, when we uh, last mile connected connectivity was talked about, so I would like to say, you know, um, when we talk about last mile connectivity, the conversation almost immediately shifts to metro, right? The understanding of last mile connectivity to the metro. Now, metro, as we know, is, uh, you know, $25 billion of investment underperforming because it's really only 10% of its capacity is running. Now, and last mile connectivity is often touted as a reason why people are not taking the metro. We recently did a study, WRI India, uh, in three cities, where we, uh, Bangalore, Delhi, and Nagpur, where we really wanted to understand from the perceptions of users what the actual needs are in last mile connectivity. I mean, what are the barriers? What, what do commuters themselves want? And the, very interestingly, the first thing that we found is that the demographic profile of a metro user is a middle class young person in the age group of 19 to 35 years, right? And they are reaching the metro station mostly by walking or by taking shared paratransit, mostly autos. Now, uh, so the rich, for the rich, metro is not attractive. For the poor, they're priced out. And for women commuters, what's happening is last mile connectivity is the barriers are, of course, terrible walking environment, long wait times. Women typically don't want to wait for more than 10 minutes to get their shared auto or whatever. So they typically are taking more expensive uh, services, whether it's a Ola or whatever, to get there than men. So in many ways, again, this becomes an equity issue. Now you talked about how do we solve this problem at scale, and you're absolutely right. This is a local government uh, issue, and municipal corporations has to step up to this. But the most important thing is that's not the only pathway. Very important pathway, absolutely. Very, very important, perhaps the most prevalent pathway. All this infrastructure investments that's coming into cities for flyovers, for coastal roads, whatever, why is it that we, we are talking about multimodal integration within that, but it's not happening? Like, for example, if you go to Mumbai, I was recently in Mexico City, and I saw those metro cables, the ropeways, but they are servicing the you know, the peripheral areas where all their slums are. Our slums are omnipresent. They're all over the city. How do you move them through ropeways within very flat terrains? The second issue is in Mumbai, where they are building this multi-layer, you have a metro, you have a flyover, so they have three layers of infrastructure, but there is a street at the bottom at some place. It has to be, right, anchored. And there is an intersection there too. Our studies in Mumbai showed that 11% of Mumbai streets are under this kind of multi-layered infrastructure, right? 
50% of the crashes happen in those 11% streets. Huge burden because again, there's no multimodal integration, no thinking. We do not bring walking infrastructure when we are developing solutions for urban mobility into the calculus of infrastructure design and planning. So clearly safety also becomes a huge, Absolutely. huge concern here. Yeah. It's one of the SDG goals, right? Exactly. So Mr. Das, you, you also mentioned that it's a localized issue and Ms. Sudeshna also concurred to that. So do you see that in the near future there could be a revival in the PPP model, uh, some changes that could be brought about which are going to be a change in the governor's style, at least when it comes to the last mile connectivities for the commuters in India? See, I'll again give you the example of what we are doing in Varanasi. There is a very unique uh, financing concept that we have brought in while we have done this project. So we say these are local issues and I said uh, uh, maybe a local municipal has to address, it's not a national issue. But uh, here for the forum to know, when uh, we are doing this project in Varanasi connecting five stations to the Gadolia Ghat, we didn't approach any Indian bank to fund us. We got this funded by a Swiss bank. Because the technology has been brought in from Switzerland, it has been uh, supported by the Swiss export credit agencies. So, so there is this project has been financed by Switzerland, almost 40 million uh, euros is what we have got it funded. And a local uh, integration, local last mile connectivity project can be funded by international agencies, is what I am trying to say here. And so why is that? Because they understand the concept They, they of understand two things. Priority is ESG. Obviously that uh, they see this uh, has a great score of ESG and you are creating an alternate to fossil fuel transportation. This is one of the safest methods of transport, which uh, does away with a lot of road rage, road accidents and all that. And uh, third is it is again a technology getting introduced to a new country or territory, which is obviously a business interest for them. So because of these uh, three reasons, we are able to attract foreign investment into a urban mobility solution. So this is just a beginning, it's just an example we have set. And I think there are many more to come. Well, that's very interesting to know that there are entities outside India who are willing to invest and because I think that also means there's a lot of trust factor that India can actually change and there's a vision for, for India to change. In that regard, ma'am, do you feel that when we're talking about sidewalk and, you, and we discussed this earlier as well, that the biggest problem is that we have a large population in our country which is sleeping on the sidewalk. Sidewalks continue to be there, uh, their houses uh, because they have nowhere to go. So how do you deal with such a situation and it's not only about people staying. We see a lot of hawkers also encroaching sidewalks. So when we are looking at a vision of a walkable city, what seems to be a solution, especially when it comes to encroachment of these areas? Let me tell you, the biggest encroachment in, on sidewalks are not the poor. It's parking, parked cars, city after city. Now, whenever we talk about removing encroachments for sidewalks, many, cities are very ingenuous, especially influential groups, in shooing out the poor from sidewalks. Easiest. Try getting those parked cars off. You can't. And this cannot happen till we continue to have free parking in our cities without any, and continue to have, you know, these kind of uh, on-street parking, people can park anywhere, parking lots also, there are, we build these parking lots, then really under, under capacity because of this, because you can encroach and park your car anywhere. So I think there needs to be a shift in our mental models about how we think about walking infrastructure, what we consider as encroachment, and what is a problem that is easy to solve. It is, at the end of the day, also a very strong equity problem in our cities. You're absolutely right. There are lots of people who live on sidewalks. Is that a mobility problem? That is a housing problem. Where is the affordable housing? Where are the rental housing? Where are the hostels for the migrant youth who come from all over? So we really need to take a systems perspective to understanding these really complex challenges in our cities. As a question was asked to the minister before, and he also said, I'm not the urban development minister, but it's true, mobility and urban development problems are interlinked. You cannot solve one without also addressing others. So there has to be this, you have to close the loop somewhere. So clearly the solutions are available as suggested by Mr. Das and Ms. Sudeshna, but it's all about re kind of uh, generating the inner, inner conscience that 
walking on the street should not be out of force, but it should be out of choice. Thank you very much, Mr. Shibda Das and Ms. Sudeshna for joining so us. Much. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Aditi, for another wonderful uh, session with uh, Dr. Sudeshna and uh, Mr. Das. And can I request Mr. Sanjay Roy, Senior Vice President of uh, Distribution and Administration, ABP Network, to join us on stage as we give a token of thanks to both our speakers. Can we please get that? Yeah. Can we have a round of applause from the audience here? Thank you so much for being an attentive audience. We have a few more engaging sessions lined up ahead. And uh, this is about wrapping up the last session, which was on urban mobility solutions, ensuring last mile connectivity. Dr. Sudeshna Chatterjee and Mr. Shivdar Das, thank you for uh, joining us this afternoon.